Good evening, everyone. This is Subham Das, Honorary Advisor of CAD. It's my immense pleasure to welcome you all to this World Human Science and Management Conference 2021. We are really proud to announce that this conference is conducted along with IIM Sambalpur, the Central University of Odisha, Koraput, and Ravensa University, Qatar. I extend my warm welcome to our esteemed speaker for today, Professor Babi Banerjee, and participants across the globe through Facebook and YouTube Live, and who are here to listen to Professor Banerjee. The broader theme of this conference is agnotological context, disciplinary practices of social science and policy frames. On behalf of CAD, I extend my profound gratitude to Professor Mahadev Jaiswal, Director of IIM Sambalpur, Professor S.K. Palit, Acting Vice Chancellor of Central University of Odisha, and Professor Sanjay Kumar Naik, esteemed Vice Chancellor of Ravensa University. The conveners of this largest virtual conference are eminent Indian historian, Professor Chandi Prasad Nanda, and eminent policy activist, writer, and philanthropist, Mr. Charudat Pranigahi. The main outcome of this conference is to come up with a national and international framework for the education system in the future. And the crux of this conference will be the use of digital technologies such as artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and virtual reality that is being increasingly adopted after the outbreak of this COVID-19 pandemic. We hope this conference would help students, faculty, researchers, and all to and all to expand their mental horizons and help the education system to adopt the best. Friends, the Center for Adivasi Research and Development is a leading research-oriented institution promoting ethnographic, empirical, and evidence-based research for engaging and addressing the challenges that the 21st century globe is facing today. The prime agenda of this institution is to come up with potential policy solution for social change while believing in the idea of 3D, debate, dialogue, and discussion, and with expertise experiencing education. The institution focuses on the marginalized communities and work for their livelihood to protect their nature, culture, language, and identity in particular. The age of modernity has witnessed that change is the only constant phenomenon for the societal purpose to enhance knowledge. Our information work for them is methodological and avoids the paradoxical frameworks which neglected so many centuries from theory to become practice. The Center for Adivasi Research and Development is sincerely believing in the concept of social marketing which is seriously looking for non-profit marketing and builds new social entrepreneurship for a check and balance mechanism to yeah. glorify yeah. generation. Yes, yes. Uh, the CAD sincerely believes in the concept of social marketing, which is seriously looking for the non-profit marketing and builds new social entrepreneurship for a check and balance mechanism and to glorify the generation to come. CAD also come to serve with holistic approach for critical thinking in education to fulfill the gaps to plan accordingly for the voiceless communities for beneficiaries direct in self-reflecting global South societies. Friends, in this evening, we have with us eminent professor Bobby Banerjee. Bobby Banerjee is a professor of management and associate dean of research and enterprise at Bayes Business School. He was also the director of the executive uh, PhD program from 2013 to 19. His primary research interests are in the areas of corporate social responsibility, sustainability, climate change, and resistance movements. Other research interests include critical management studies, indigenous ecology, and post-colonial studies. He has published extensively in leading scholarly journals and is the author of two books, Corporate Social Responsibility, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and the co-edited volume, Organizations, Market, and Imperial Formations Towards an Anthropology of Globalization. 
He served on the editorial board of seven international journals and was a senior editor at Organizational Studies from 2007 to 2019. He is an associate editor at Business and Society. He is also a co-founder of Ethos, the Center for Responsible Enterprise at Ways Business School. Professor Benarji uh, teaches an undergraduate module of climate change and, and the world economy, which offers critical and multidisciplinary perspective on climate change, focusing on issues like climate justice, policy, and climate activism. He also leads an MBA international study tour of Cuba, where we where meet business early leaders, government officials, students and academics to understand the challenges of an economy in transition with particular reference to environmental and social sustainability. Um, Professor Banerjee has completed his BSc from St. Joseph College, Bangalore University of India and MBA degree uh, from University of Bombay. And he has also completed his PhD at University of Massachusetts at Ahmed, USA. So Professor Banerjee will deliver his talk on decolonizing the Anthropocene. Now I would like to invite Professor Banerjee to initiate his talk. Over to Professor Banerjee. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. One minute. Uh, uh, it's really sorry. I would like to invite Professor Loknath Misra to go for an introductory remark from uh, Central University of Weizel. Then Professor Banerjee will speak. Thank you, sir. Uh, very welcome to all of you. Good evening. Uh, and uh, on behalf of uh, Director uh, Card and uh, Mizoram Central University, I welcome Professor Bobby Banerjee uh, to deliver a speech on decolonizing the Anthropocene. Uh, I hope after uh, going through his biodata and uh, listening his biodata, I hope he will highlight uh, us about the uh, action research and uh, about the um, uh, different kinds of research on this uh, decolonizing the Anthropocene. And uh, we will be benefited from his uh, talk in this evening. And our participants will be uh, very much uh, delighted to listen to his talk. Thank you. And over to Bobby Banerjee, Professor Bobby Banerjee. Thank you for that extensive introduction. Uh, I see 17 blank faces on my screen. I want to try an experiment. So, you know what? Let me request you to turn on your cameras for a few minutes. I want to try something. Um, might not work in a virtual setting, but let's give it a shot. Yeah, it's always good to see some faces behind these squares. Don't be shy now. It's all right. I'm here. I can. You can see me. Let me see you as well. If I want to try something. I need people's faces for this to work. Otherwise, it will not work. I know some people are being, this is being live streamed, but trust me on this, right? Just, just trust me. Don't be shy now. All right. At the count of three, let me share my screen first. So you still have time to put on your screen, uh, your, your camera, because I want to see how this works. People can see this? Yeah? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Right. As I said, this might not work in the virtual setting, but if you have your cameras on, it'll work. So at the count of three, all of us, yeah, let's take a deep breath, hold for five seconds, and then exhale, okay? Trust me, this is not a trick. So follow me, one, two, three, a deep breath, hold, exhale. Congratulations, you have just breathed in today's concentration 412.86 parts of carbon dioxide per million you're the first human beings in the planet since humanity evolved to have breathed this level of carbon yeah this is the highest level of carbon dioxide concentration ever recorded since records were kept so the global atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide which is the principal gas causing climate change it passed 400 parts per million for the first time in 2013, probably more than 3 million years ago. Now, scientists tell us that anything more than 350 parts per million is dangerous. Dangerous meaning 
millions of livelihoods lost, lives lost, floods, fires. Yeah. We already passed uh, 350 four, five years ago. But then what do scientists know? And nobody listens to the scientists anyway, right? But if you listen to the scientists, this is what they're saying. So dangerous climate change will happen at two degrees centigrade, right? Dangerous, as I said, meaning uh, economic losses, uh, health issues, millions dead, dispossessed, refugees. Yeah, that's two degrees centigrade warming. Now, to achieve two degrees centigrade, it's going to take one trillion tons of carbon to reach this temperature. Yeah, we're about halfway there. So since the industrial revolution, since industrialization in the last 250 years, half a trillion is already up there. At current rates, if we proceed, business as usual, it's going to take only 40 years for the next 500 billion tons to be added to reach two degrees centigrade warming. So the current warming is at one degree. This is what the planet is warming at. At Paris, uh, uh, it was committed an aspirational target of 1.5. It's actually supposed to be two, but they want to try for 1.5, not to exceed 1.5, right? So the real life and death question is, forget 1.5, you're never going to reach 1.5. Can we avoid, avoid two degrees centigrade warming? That is the life and death question. I've been attending a lot of these, these COP conferences now for the past 15 years. Now, if you asked me this question 10 years ago, is it possible to avoid a two degree centigrade warming? I would have probably said, yes, very difficult, extremely difficult, but possible. Today, if you ask me if it's going to be two degrees centigrade, if you can avoid, the answer is an emphatic no. There is no way in hell we are talking, we can go down below two. So I was at Glasgow for COP26 and a report came out that saying we should be preparing for a 2.6, 2.7 degree hotter world, hotter world, which is going to have unimaginable consequences, especially on developing countries, right? So that's, that's the background. So how did we get here? We have uh, arrived at this, this particular ecological crisis through the way we organize our system. So if you look at our human systems here, we organized our economies uh, in a particular way of production, of consumption, uh, you know, of, of population uh, controls, of governance, of technology. It's created great wealth. There is no doubt about that, right? The system has created a lot of wealth. It's also created a lot of inequalities. But these earth systems, human systems, have a externality. So all the wealth we have, all the comforts we have from home, it comes at a price, right? Through CO2 emissions, right? which affects the atmosphere, right? So all this stuff affects the atmosphere, that has impacts. Rising temperatures, sea level rise, extreme events, which we are seeing all over the world already. So they, these changes in the atmosphere has certain impacts. It affects our food, our water, our land goes away. Then those impacts should then also affect what kind of world we want to plan for the, the species and the planet to be sustainable. Right? So that's the, your classic cycle. This all makes sense. It looks very logical, very intuitive. Let me pause for a minute. You could put on your microphones. This picture looks very, as I said, logical. Does anyone find a problem with this picture? What do you think is wrong with this? Anybody? you guys are a shy lot so do i take it everybody agrees with this is there anybody who thinks there's a problem with this right sir tell me what do you think the problem is sir problem is both uh, human system and the earth system as well sir what do you mean Sir, humans are doing very serious tragedy for this climate change and uh, the whole entire planet is facing a lot of problems. We suddenly believe in NST theory, nature, science and technology. Now technology kills your own grandmother here, sir. You're kind of there, but the fundamental problem of this, which is a fundamental problem in all of Western science, it assumes these are two separate issues, that earth and humans are somehow separated. This is the fundamental problem. And it's because of this separation of human and earth, 
we are in the mess we are today, right? And that is the fundamental basis of all Western philosophies and science. That Earth, human beings are somehow separate and better than nature. Now, Western civilization is only about 3,000 years old, probably less, 2,000 years old perhaps. A lot of older civilizations never made that separation. This is a false separation. So if you look at indigenous uh, philosophies, the, the tribal communities in India, in, 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 in the Amazon, in Africa, in Asia, they never had that separation, right? So this is a, a visual from uh, uh, Panchamama from the Aztec. Whereas, as you can see, it's, it's part, part of the same system. There is no separation between humanity and the planet. And that's a very fundamental way of looking at your relationship with, with the Earth. Very different way. Right. So all your way you organize your economies, when you don't have that assumption that we are somehow separate from nature, is going to be profoundly different. Right. And this is what is we have now entered um, the new era called the Anthropocene. Uh, the planet formed about four and a half, four point five billion years ago, uh, the planet, and then we've had this series of of lives and extension. We are right here. And, human beings, we came very, very recently, and in that short period of time, we have done more damage to the planet than all our ancestors put together. And if we don't get our act together, we will follow the path of the previous ancestors and be extinct you know, quite soon, right? So the Anthropocene then refers to a new epoch in the geological history of the world, where it's not nature anymore. Human beings have become the dominant cause of environmental change of the planet, right? So things like uh, urbanization, agriculture, changes in carbon and nitrogen cycles, global warming, sea level rises, ocean edification, habitat loss, you know, global diffusion of human made materials, all this happened because of us. Many of these changes are permanent and have affected the earth system. It creates new geological strata. For example, plastics have already become a layer of the fossil record. So you can actually see in the Earth's sedimentary layer is plastics. This is going to be our legacy. It's plastic. Okay? It's permanent. right? And nuclear radiation, since the first nuclear tests, have also permanently left its mark. There were no nuclear radiation till we came along. So these are artificial human-made uh, elements. They've also now stayed permanently in the record. So this then is the Anthropocene. Uh, a new age. Uh, this is a very cool photographer called uh, Edward Butinsky. Uh, he takes these photographs uh, of the Anthropocene. Uh, this is plastics recycling in Nairobi, Kenya. By 2050, scientists tell us there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish on a per, value, per volume basis. Right? This is the kind of legacy we are leaving behind. Uh, this is a potash mine in Brzezinski, Russia, taken from, from, from the top. And this is logging in Vancouver Island. So this then is the Anthropocene. This is the, the current state of the planet, right? But then the issue then is, okay, it assumes that for some, re for, for some reason, there's a singular humanity that out of six billion people in the world are responsible for this. And that is not true because Global politics in the Anthropocene, if you look at emissions per capita, right, it is completely skewed. So the, the ones on the red are a bit more. So the world average CO2 emissions per ton, uh, per person is five tons. The UK is 12 tons. The US is 18 tons, 20 tons. So if you look at the average African consumer or the average, average Asian consumer, even China, which is the world's biggest emitter of CO2 and India, which is number three, if you look at the per capita, it is very, very low, right? So this is unequal. The atmosphere has been used unequally in the last 200 years, right? So suddenly now to say, oh, the world is face facing a global uh, ecological crisis, we all have to work together, it hides these facts. But the fact that it is an unequal and differentiated responsibility, right? When, when we've got over 2 billion people in the planet without, drink, without access to clean drinking water, right? 800 million starvation deaths every year. 
and to then expect that you need to reduce CO2 emissions globally across every part of the world without a sliding kind of scale is kind of ludicrous. It's also obscene in a way, right? So the world's 10% of the most wealthiest population, they're responsible for more than 52% of uh, carbon emissions. And the world's poorest 50%, they only contribute to 7%, right? So this is not obviously a, a very equitable state of being. So these are the countries going to be most affected by climate change. Again, we're talking about millions of uh, lives lost, displacements. And these are all, without exception, very poor countries, right? And they, they bear, they're, they're going to be bearing the brunt of the climate change impacts. The contribution of these countries to CO2 emissions is negligible compared to what the West has, has, has produced, right? But these are the ones that are going to suffer the most. So basically, climate change is at one level, climate injustice, yeah? Now, what are the common commonalities? I'm just going to skip to this, of, of this. It is no accident that the countries I showed you in that list are all former colonies. It's also no accident that the, uh, the countries who are, who are fighting the most to get uh, these emissions trading, emissions agreements done are the former colonies. Because colonialism was constitution of European law. So notions of sovereignty and international law was based on colonial forms of, of development. So if you look at the Anthropocene, it is a colonial discourse in many ways, yeah, uh, based on particular formations of capital. So in the colonial era, uh, to a very uh, racialized division of the, of the planet, you had constructions of civilization, civilized, uncivilized, primitive, modern, developed, underdeveloped, right? These categories were created, but the authority, the power always remained on the size of the civilized or the developed in the, in the colonial era, right? So once you divided the world into modern, primitive, civilized, uncivilized, right? Then the problem became, how do we create order in this universal kind of construct? And how does everybody fall, follow this path to so-called civilization? Yeah? That is the fundamental problem in the way this was set up. So the Anthropocene is not a homogenous discourse. It is very much rooted in colonial relations of power. And one of the, one of the outcomes of this kind of modernity and fights is these environmental conflicts. But one of my, my research areas is I study violent extractive uh, uh, conflicts in the extractive industries. So I look at conflicts in, in, in Latin America, uh, partly in India, in, in North America, mainly with indigenous tribes, tribal communities who are in conflict with their governments and with mining companies. Yeah? And these are all violent conflicts uh, where the state uh, is engaged in killing its own citizens, so to speak. And it happens in India also all the time. Right? At the last count, about a year ago when I was writing a paper, it was more than 6,500 are ongoing conflicts happening today. Yeah? And this is a sample of where this is happening. Now, there are more countries. Only reason I did this, it fits into one slide. So it's all violent conflicts involving communities and the mining industry, right? If you look at this list, you know, what strikes you? Let's stop for 30 seconds. Anybody? These are, as I said, sites of violent conflict between about a strike. Anything strikes you from this list? Almost all, I think Thailand is the only exception, I guess, are former colonies. Okay? It is no coincidence that all these conflicts are happening in former colonies. It is also no coincidence that the companies, uh, institutions involved in these conflicts are headquartered in London, Paris, Berlin, Montreal. That's where the mining money is in Canada, right? Also, apart from, say, China, Vietnam is a communist country, and I think Laos is a constitutional monarchy, except these two countries, all of these countries are democracies, right? So which begs the question, how is it possible in modern democratic countries, the state is actively engaged in killing its own citizens, which are mainly indigenous tribes, indigenous communities, 
for the purpose of extraction and, and creating wealth and value. Who's that? Where is that wealth going to? And why are people being killed for it? Or willing to give up their lives yeah, for this? So that, that's again a consequence of this kind of form of development, which is a much more very violent form of development, which creates wealth for a few at the expense uh, of the people who are actually directly involved or, or whose communities are built on these lands. In terms of visual, we all know where this has been extracted from, and we also know where these minerals are going, right? So it's the same kind of colonial forms of extraction. Only thing is right now, the white man is gone. We can't blame the white man anymore. But what we have are native elites in these countries, including India, who carry on the same form of colonial extraction. This time the money is probably not going to, to the empire in, in England, but it's going to private capital in a way. So the forms of extraction really have not changed in 250 years. And as I said, these are, are, are violent conflicts. This is the, the recent conflict in, uh, in, the, in the US uh, involving the, the uh, Dakota, uh, in, in South Dakota, uh, the Sioux tribes. Uh, it's about four years ago, about a pipeline. This was in Marikana in South Africa, where uh, 34 unarmed miners were shot by police. This is in, uh, in Peru, Peru and Amazon, uh, when the whole belts of indigenous land were opened up for logging and mining. And again, police shot and killed unarmed indigenous protesters, all in the case of logging right, and mining. Now, the UN was quite concerned about this because, uh, as I said, there's been a, a rise in the killings of indigenous people and, uh, and also environmental activists in a way. So they formed a, a special rapporteur to ask what is going on. You know, why is there so much violence happening across the world when it comes to mining? And this was the finding of the United Nations Human Rights Commission that the business model, uh, I'm not going to read this out, is not fully, fully conducive to the fulfillment of indigenous people's rights, particularly their rights to self-determination and, and, and property. Yeah? And they also concluded that many companies do not commit to more than complying. They fail to independently conduct the human rights due diligence. And there are significant imbalances of power between indigenous peoples and mining companies, right? And both governments and industry actors are doing very little to address these power imbalances. So uh, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights was passed some years ago after decades of action by indigenous communities and this is what the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People say, right? That we need a, and a lot of these problems, and this is happening in India as well, is about land grabs, land acquisition. Under what conditions is land acquisition take place? What are the resettlement criteria? Are they enforced or are people dispossessed, right? So consultation becomes a key issue is that uh, this is how the UN Declaration describes it. We need free, prior, informed consent particularly in connection with any kind of development on the lands, right? Does this happen? It's not just in India that there's a conflict. It does not happen. It's there on paper, but push comes to shove, whether it is the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, at the end of the day, this process is not followed or there is violence in this process. So the World Bank, for example, also jumped in and they, just, they said that, yes, we need to have a culturally appropriate way of consulting right but this is the clincher at the end you can consult all you want whatever the community says it does not constitute a veto right and that's the fundamental problem it's very difficult for them to actually say no the consultations are all about okay you know how many schools how many jobs how many hospitals uh, how many royalties that's the issue never should mining proceed at all right and that's the fundamental conflict so the US, which was vigorously opposed both to the Declaration of the Rights and to consultation, finally reluctantly agreed to accept it, but they came up with their own definition that, yes, we recognize the Declaration of the Rights, uh, we understand it involves consultation, but not necessarily the agreement of those leaders. Now, what does this mean? What kind of, what do you mean to have a consultation when you don't need agreement, right? So this is again, colonial power at its, at its worst. So the conflict between the Native Americans who were protesting the pipeline 
and the US government was precisely this. They said that we were not informed. These are these these pipeline is going to damage our waterways. They're going to go through our sacred sites, right? But basically there was no agreement needed. They just went ahead anyway, right? And there's a racialized element to this. Uh, initially, the pipe was supposed to go through a, a, a town called Bismarck in South Dakota, uh, where 92% of the population was white. And the town uh, meeting, the consultancy meeting said, no, pipeline is not going to go through here, send it through Indian land, tribal land, right? So again, this does not exactly call for a particular democratic process, right? And that was the fight. And this was a violent conflict. Uh, unarmed Native Americans were met with tanks, tear gas bullets, you know, drones, attack dogs, you know, mace, uh, again, directed at, at people. Uh, who didn't, who were essentially protecting the land. This is happening today. This is not some colonial cowboys and Indians 200 years ago. This happened three years ago. Yeah. Uh, and a similar thing, uh, for those of you who remember, there was a major oil spill in the 90s, Exxon Valdez, one of the worst at that point of time, one of the worst environmental disasters. And it led to a loss of livelihood for the, for the fishing tribes who were living around there. Uh, but this was the finding of... Uh, an anthropologist hired by ExxonMobil uh, when they're looking for compensation, that uh, because culture for these tribes are in their mind, there's really no loss of resources. So there is no environmental disaster. So you don't need to pay compensation, right? So again, this is the colonial relation of power, which they decide that culture is in these tribes' mind and therefore you don't need to pay compensation, right? So you see how in the Anthropocene, these are very unequal ways of being. Uh, as I said, I've been, uh, uh, I, I study resistance movements um, in the mining industry, and these are some quotes. These are either partly in the public domain uh, or through my interviews. And I'm trying to think in terms of, and again, the common, common theme, as you can see, is united and fight and death, right? So from memory, the first one would be Mexico, India, Brazil, Australia, and Chile, right? Very, very different countries. But look at the, the common narrative uh, of the people who are actually extracting, uh, who are fighting these extractive industries, right? So what explains this kind of, of difference? They're also part of the Anthropocene, but they live very differently than, than the way we do, right? And that's where I guess we, there is a need to decolonize this discourse of this Anthropocene, where the world is facing a, a common crisis. It might be a common crisis, but it was not created by everybody, right? And that's where the notion of coloniality of power, which talks about how societies are racially classified, that is the basis of the Anthropocene. And we need to address that in a way, right? And this comes from Latin America, um, uh, a lot of resistance studies as well, and very strongly linked to indigenous movements, which looks at looking at alternative knowledge systems. So the, the separation I talked about between humans and earth uh, is not a universally accepted separation, right? So a lot of indigenous philosophies have a different way of relating to the planet. And that's, that's uh, one of the projects of, I guess, the decolonial projects, one of the, the aims is to be able to do this. So the, one of the key messages is this. I talked about this, there's human nature dualism. It's a product of enlightenment thought. And even theories like the Anthropocene and the theory of Gaia as a self-regulating system, they still reflect this particular kind of rationality. And I'm in a business school, the way we study the environment and sustainability is not going to solve the problem. It's going to make it even uh, much worse in a way. So what do we need to do is we need to change the terms of the conversation and figure out different ways of, of relating to the planet if we want our species to survive. But these alternative forms of knowledge, uh, like indigenous knowledge, have been systematically either subjugated or appropriated, sometimes without compensation, right? And those are the kind of knowledge systems we need to we need to challenge. So to give you an example, some of the tensions, it's everybody now is into indigenous knowledge. It's very hot, it's very sexy, especially in the West. Let's learn from the tribal people, right? Who, who've been practicing this wisdom for 30, 40,000 years. But there are tensions. Every knowledge has power systems, right? And the tensions are quite apparent when we look to understand traditional ecological uh, knowledge. So 
There's an anthropologist called Wade Davis. He was doing a research on the ingredients of ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a very patent, potent psychoactive brew used by the shamans in Amazonian tribes. They use it in spiritual ceremonies that goes back thousands of years. It has got particularly hallucinogenic properties, right? And those properties arise from the combination of two plants, which are completely unrelated. So the Amazon has over 80,000 species, and two of those plants combined together produces this, this brew called Ayahuasca. So the West uh, discovered, found, found out this brew, and they wanted to analyze this. So they came in, they did a chemical composition, and they said that dimethyl tryptonine is the active ingredient, right? So this is the one which causes the, gives the psycho, psychotropic properties of the plants, right? The tribe recognized seven different varieties of the species, right? All of them was classified as one. So the anthropologists asked these people a, a logical question. Out of 80,000 unrelated species, how did you know that a combination of only two could produce this effect? Which was a logical question to ask. And the shamans replied, the plants teach us, the plants taught us. What does that mean? So I got pressing first, what do you mean the plants taught you? Plants don't teach. I said, well, on the night of the full moon, we take out these seven plants and the plants sing to us. And that's how we know which ones to combine. So either they were bullshitting the guy or not, I don't know, but this was their knowledge. Now, Western science can identify the active ingredient to DMT. We can use MRIs to find out uh, how our brain is affected uh, by, by injecting this property, right? What Western science will never accept is plants gave this knowledge to the tribes. They will always say, no, there must be another way. And that is a difference because there is no uh, a hierarchical difference between the, between nature and these and uh, people who are living in, in in that in the forest, right? So of course plants are teachers; they have agency in a way. But this is something whether you want to call it traditional knowledge or not. This will be called ethnoscience, whereas chemistry is never called ethnochemistry. That's universal. Yeah. And this is, we have the same kind of language. So if you look at uh, the U the UN uh, uh, policy, is just plant trees and everything's going to be okay. We're going to absorb. So they said, we need sustainable forest management. We need uh, climate change mitigation to do this, right? Uh, and this is one of the indigenous people in that conference said, this is so hierarchical. In Cree, which is a tribe in North America, we don't have animate, inanimate uh, comparisons. Animals have souls, trees are who, not what. In another uh, global policy making, uh, venue. This was in Kyoto, the Kyoto Protocol, which was signed to reduce, uh, uh, to tackle emissions, was to have this global forest policy, right? So planting trees became a way of getting carbon credits because trees absorb CO2. So they wanted to be quite inclusive um, and not just have, you know, big politicians and big companies. So they decided to call everybody, uh, you know, major actors like logging companies, mining companies, politicians, even the green groups, the activist groups, the NGOs, to come up with a global forest policy. Guess whom they forgot to invite? The people who live in the forests, the tribal people, right? And they had their own conference protesting this, that you are talking about forests only as trees which absorb carbon. That's not the way we view forests. Forest for us is our food, our agriculture, it's our medicine, it's our culture, it's our ancestor. It's our people. It's not just something which absorbs carbon. That's the fundamental difference, I guess, in, in, in a particular worldview and how you treat forests. There was a recent case again in 2017 where this has come to a, a, a case, a, a legal issue now. This is the, the Wanguni River in New Zealand. And in 2017, it became the first river to be granted a status of a human being, of a person, right? Uh, the Maoris have always worshipped this river. They say that the river is their ancestor, right? Uh, and they wanted to make sure that there's no development happening which would harm that river. Uh, until until 2017, there wasn't an issue. But then in 20, the reason why they went to court 
was the New Zealand government wanted to harness the water of this river, right, and give it to electricity generating plants. Now suddenly, an ancestor becomes private property. That's when they decided to go to court and say, no, we do not want any development in 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 in, in this. Sorry, in this uh, in this development as well. So they won they won the, they won the case and the government for the first time granted. Uh, this personhood status. So what happens now is that when there's any development project, this is this is the traditional ceremony of granting the uh, river personhood, right? So what happens now is that if there's any project here, you have a lawyer for the government, you have a lawyer for the company, you have a lawyer for the Maori people, indigenous tribe, and you have a lawyer for the river, right? Who will then kind of decide, right? So this is the difference in the I guess an Anthropocene. So there's one set of eyes will look at this river and say, you know what, I'm going to put tons and tons of concrete into this, some cement, some steel, right? And I will dam it, yeah? I'll control the water, I'll channel the water, then I will sell it to the hotels and golf courses and swimming pools, right? And that's perfectly valid form of development. That's one, one way of looking at it. Another set of eyes will look at this river and say, I am the river and the river is me. That's a very different view of development, yeah? And both should coexist, but obviously we know which kind of development uh, has more power and who tends to rule, right? So I'm going to end with this, the notion of sustainability, which has obviously become very, very, uh, you know, critical in a way, but how this is again being captured by corporations, by the market. So when it first came out uh, in, the, in the 80s, they talked about development that this is the classic definition meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations right when this first came out businesses just ignored it they thought it's not a big deal but then as environmental concerns grew the business decided that we need to do something about this this business council for sustainable development is the most powerful lobby group in the world it consists of the ceos of the fortune 500 companies they're there at every UN meeting. They're there at every COP meeting, uh, the World Economic Forum. And they said, yes, we have a vision of sustainable development to maintain freedom through voluntary initiatives. Okay. I don't know how this came into suddenly became a sustainability issue. It's very clear. We don't need laws. We don't want regulation. We don't need coercion. We can do this by ourselves through voluntary stuff, which is a, a fairly dangerous way to look at this, right? And then... Uh, uh, the CEO of Monsanto, I guess, uh, that point of time, they were a chemical company. Now they're not. They're a life sciences company. And he talked about how sustainability involves cold, rational business logic. Right? And then finally, the ultimate triumph, if you will, that this is the Dow Jones index, that a sustainable co corporation is one that aims at increasing long-term shareholder value by integrating economic, environmental, and social growth opportunities. So this is the infamous triple bottom line. Now you see how the story has transformed. Suddenly it has shifted from planetary sustainability now to corporate sustainability, right? Why does the corporation have to be sustainable for the planet to be sustainable? One could argue that a corporation in its current form must be destroyed then. And what happens if economic, environmental and social issues are not growth opportunities? What happens when they don't? increase shareholder value. Because if you follow this argument to the extreme, which is sadly what is happening, then you will end up teaching, I will end up teaching this to my students in a business school. Thank you for your time and attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, sir, for your enlightening and very Oh, wonderful deliberation. I would like to invite uh, Professor B.C. Das for, to go for a quick comment on such talk. Then Subham Das will continue this question and answer session. Yeah, I'm just reading the chat. Go ahead. Thank you, sir, for your uh, wonderful lecture. And we are uh, very much uh, privileged to listen to you, sir. A very dangerous situation uh, described uh, by esteemed thought leader uh, in this talk. Actually, really, uh, the dangerous climate change. Uh, in the name of development, human being has uh, done a lot of 
destruction uh, to our nature and uh, we have done uh, a lot of uh, uh, the consequences that we suffer day by day starting from uh, the policy practices existing in different uh, democratic and non democratic nations and we see increasing uh, defense budgets nuclear fallouts emission of to toxic gases global warming and greenhouse effects radioactive waves and many things are happening in the name of development and uh, uh, i may say in a rhetoric language the daughter of a great mother called nature and the mother of a great daughter called technology science is now vulnerable to protect the mother nature both human and non human life world science has given birth to anthropocene and has empowered human being to have maximum control over the uh, planetary world sir my uh, questions what i read here is it easy to decolonize anthropocene in this planetary world is it possible to evolve an earth system science intended for sustainable development in the age of anthropocene and in the time of severe exploitation of the nature sir yeah the answer is no it's not uh, if you're looking for hope don't come to me uh, what i think will happen is uh, a it has to be a breakdown of a system it yes we need a system change we need everything to be changed it's not going to happen at a global level uh, we've had uh, 20 25 years of climate negotiation and nothing has changed you know 25 years ago at the first cop it was countries should do something last month i was at glasgow countries should do something so i have a what is called a, a mad max vision of the world is that i think there'll be pockets of, of sustainability I don't think there's going to be a huge national or international kind of movement towards this. Uh, I think there'll be a collapse of ecosystems in many ways. I think there'll be a collapse of societies, right? Uh, there will be fights over water, many, many wars everywhere. But you'll find essentially a descent. I know this sounds a very bleak, dystopian future, but I'll, you know, I'll be dead and gone soon. I'm very happy to do that. But it's the next generation of people who got to worry about this, right? So what's going to happen, you'll have these pockets. Uh, as I said, described as the Mad Max scenario. This is the original Mad Max, not the current one uh, with, with Mel Gibson. And you'll have a decentralized, you know, smaller regions, if you will, uh, controlled by militia, right? I think there'll be a breakdown of the national system in some years to come. So no, I don't believe that there will be a global solution to this. Uh, there will be many solutions. Most of them will be local. Um, and uh, yeah, and the fight for resources will continue. I think you will probably have See, the problem is the nation state. I know this sounds horrible to say. The nation state is a problem. It is an artificial construct created by Europe. And we're seeing the problems happening all over the world, including India, right? In trying to get this diverse group of people into one nation state, right? So that breakdown is going to happen. It's already happening in many ways, right? The problem is about control of resources. Uh, so I think what will end up happening is a loose confederation where the nation state is the more legitimate purveyor of violence, so they control the army and everything else. But you will have smaller groups who will be delinking from the nation state. So the real issue is not about a, a universal solution. The real issue is about coexistence. Is it possible for a, a different systems to coexist? And I think those are the experiments I'm seeing yeah, in countries like, like Costa Rica, countries like uh, Colombia as well. So the answer to your question is no, I don't think it's possible to have a global solution to this. So now I'd like to request uh, uh, Professor Subhumdas to go for the question and answer session. Read the questions. Yeah, I'm reading the chat as well. Uh, go ahead, I'm listening. Yes, sir. Actually, um, um, thank you for your uh, uh, enlightening presentation that you have uh, this is your presentation as well as the debate of Anthropocene has raised many questions. Actually, who entitled human beings to destroy the nature? You know, does the earth system uh, only belongs to the human being? 
or does the earth really need homo sapiens who have been destroying the nature to fulfill their own selfish interest you know these questions we need to ask ourselves and um, every city, every conscious citizen should uh, of the global citizen should ask questions uh, to themselves that what they can contribute for the protection of the nature to protection of the planetary life as well so there are few questions in the chat box so sir if i will see, if you say i will read or yeah, i'm reading them just one second okay so, okay so. well yeah i mean the answer to the first question yes we we already seeing that we already seeing that catastrophe and this this is the this is what i meant by colonial forms of extraction right is that the quickest way for a poor country to get gdp yeah is to dig things out of the ground and sell them there's no added value right and very very cheap commodity prices and that relation between the you know the first world if you will and the third that is that continues that has not that has not stopped so the problem is with that with, with that extraction and then this is the 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 other other part of it is that the wealth is being extracted at the expense of life so yes there's always obviously environmental damage um and the blame also goes to those those countries oh look how corrupt they are oh look they've got no no environmental laws right oh look how much they pollute now what the west has done is outsourced its pollution so we all blame china right because they have emit so much co2 but who is buying that shit it is our addiction to cheap cars cheap tvs cheap computers cheap watches all the stuff is being produced there and we are buying it cheap and then we blame them for for co2 right so it's a completely unjust system if you really want to to take uh, transparency then every ton of co2 emitted by china for a product which is sold here has to be accounted for here so none of these mechanisms like carbon trading have any meaning what carbon trading does is simply gives you the right to buy to be able to pollute that's not going to solve climate change right so we need a very different kind of way of of, of looking at this and the other problem is it outs to outsource the supply chain so everybody talks about renewables oh great solar electric cars batteries right where is the elements that make up the battery come from it's cobalt like lithium all that is mined in the congo right so at the end of the day there's a 10 year old kid with a pickaxe who's picking the cobalt so i can drive my tesla here and feel good about myself and how i'm saving the planet right so that's a supply chain which never gets to come in in those pictures so yeah it is a very uneven uh, distribution but it is a uh, and a way which we reward the whole system is completely obscene we live in a world everybody talks about gdp the world bank gives you loan on gdp right everybody knows the problems of gdp right the oil spill i talked about that increased the the us and uk's gdp if i go out now and get hit by a car london's gdp goes up right the, the gdp just measures transactions so we're living in an economy where a, a dead tree is worth more than a living one and that's what we're rewarding so unless those basic evaluation factors change nothing is going to change right okay there's another question about new liberal policies yeah yeah it... yeah well a decolonize their greed and selling natural resources yeah yeah as i said that's the quickest way to do this but here's the problem i don't want to again homogenize you know india has not one country okay it's a huge divide and yes india's growth and you know the number of people in absolute poverty has declined dramatically there is no doubt all over the world the number of people in absolute poverty have come out you know lots of lots of stats show that right so of course, and this has happened because of economic development there is no doubt about that the problem is so as inequality so the benefits of economic growth especially in china and india now uh, you know brazil is the most unequal country india is i think in the top 5 of the most unequal countries right so when people say that yes i think there are what i don't know the last percent the number so i could be wrong about this the number of people who don't have electricity in india 
there's quite a significant number, right? So at one level, of course, it makes sense to play that post-colonial card. How dare you tell us to cut our emissions? You know, we've got whatever, 200 million people, I don't know the number, without electricity. That should be our first priority, which is absolutely right. So how can you treat people without electricity the same as me living here, saying that I have to cut my emissions? The problem with that argument is all the electricity generation in countries like India and China, they're not going to the poor people. They're going to the cities in a way, right? So the fundamental basic thing, that's not the reason why they're building coal-fired plants. They're going to industry, right? They're going to, to buy air conditioners and cars. That's where the money is going. So to play that card, you've got to be a bit careful that, yes, I would like to see what kind of, of basic infrastructural development is happening. Uh, but that's only going to, to a very privileged few. One more question of denial of climate change. Yeah, there are climate denials, but to be honest now, you know, I mean, he, uh, apart from that idiot Donald Trump, who said uh, climate change is a Chinese conspiracy. But to be honest, I don't really think there's any denial anymore. And it's been so for a while. Um, I think what there is is inaction is postponement. So instead of 2030, and that's what India did, right, for net zero, let's move it to 2070. So you push the problem further and further away. Meanwhile, the emissions keep going up. Yeah, Emissions have come down only twice in the last 50 years. Only twice. First, during the last financial crisis, it went up again. And second time is now, because of COVID. So what 25 years of climate negotiations could not do, a single microbe has done in one year, is bring down emissions. But it has come at a huge cost, right? Millions of lives have been, livelihoods have been destroyed. What, six million people dead, I think, or five and a half million people dead. So the question is, and this is the hardest question to ask, if you really want the future of the planet and the species, imagine this to be a permanent state of economic contraction. What would that mean? It means it's not about, we don't need more accumulation, we need distribution. That is a real issue. Right. So if you want this negative growth to continue and you don't want people to starve and you want a basic level of well-being, there is enough wealth in the planet to focus on distribution than focus on more accumulation because that accumulation is only going to a privileged few and that accumulation has an outcome of dispossessing people and despoiling the planet. So what's the point of having that kind of system when we know and we've seen some of its problems? So I don't think denial is a problem. I think it's inaction. Yes, sir. Uh, I have also uh, witnessed a news in 2018 oh. that what happened that uh, in Cape Town, one of the prominent city of South Africa that ran out of water after the uh, continuous three years of drought yeah. and the government started water sanctioning yeah. and uh, taken by many policy measures uh, and uh, now the, the situation have uh, just come up, uh, come out of that uh, worsening. Then how you look at the situation? So, um, you know, even India, even major cities of India are facing the water crisis and water space. Yeah. And now, now the scientists are also thinking how to disalign the water. Yeah. Uh, so how you look at, how you address this situation issue? Yeah, well desalinization is a very very capital intensive and it's you know it's huge you know the water price is going to be high in if yeah, you see in is, after 20 to 30 years yes it is the 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 next world war will happen because of water yes I think. yes yes definitely it's very much very much an issue absolutely it is a that's what i meant by the my mad max scenario this is where you're going to have control over forget about control over gold and copper it'll be control over water control over yes. air where can i go where i can breathe the air without dying Yes, right. exactly. Okay. So those will be the basic issues: control over land, arable land. Where can I grow my crops without poisoning it? Right. So that's what I'm saying. The, the in terms of control over resources, it'll be a very basic resources. So yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, water is going to be a major issue, and this is where we are not talking about uh, these notion of of climate refugees, right? So yes, I think we're talking about by 2040, there's going to be 80 million climate refugees looking for homes. This is a new category. So these yes, are not yes. refugees escaping political persecution, right? These are not refugees escaping religious persecution. 
These are not even economic migrants looking for a better job. They are leaving because their homes have gone underwater. Yes, definitely. Where are these 80 million people going to go? They're not going to migrate to Afghanistan or Zimbabwe. They're going to come here, as they should, with any, any sensible person would. Now, in the West, you're talking about 10 million, you know, 10,000 refugees. People make such a big noise about it. Can you imagine how you're going to control 80 million people who are going to be knocking on your door without violence? Yes, that's a serious question. How are you going to stop 80 million people from coming to, to Europe without large-scale violence? And that's where we are headed to. Now we have also seen that how Delhi is suffocated now. The pollution level has increased dramatically. Now it's impacting and the schools have been yeah. shut down for, for days. You know, yeah. this the climate change is now is posed a serious question to think about the individual social responsibility of every citizen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Fine. Any other questions? Yes, uh, yes sir. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, uh, sir, uh, myself, Rutranarayan Das. So my question is, uh, the, do you believe the ancient civilization was the best uh, uh, rather than the democratical practices for policy frames to future? Uh, like uh, democracy means to conduct uh, only elections and declare results uh, yeah. to form government. Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, first of all, I don't want to romanticize ancient civilizations. It's a lot of oppression in, in, in indigenous societies as well. There are issues of gender uh, as well, uh, issues of sexuality. So I don't want to kind of so somehow say this is going to be the, you know, suddenly this romantic solution to all our problems. Uh, in terms of democracy, yes, I agree with you. This We are not living in democracies. Is India a democracy? Are you kidding me? Right? These are these are a democracy of the powerful people. As, uh, the, as in a democratic parliamentary system, we have the power to change political parties every maybe four or five years, but we have very little power about decisions that affect our lives, right? So don't forget all these conflicts I showed you are happening in democracies, except China and Vietnam and Laos perhaps. So how is it possible in a democracy where a state is killing its own citizens with, with impunity, right? So that, that's a fundamental problem. So obviously if you go and speak to uh, person who's just lost their land and talk about democracy, you know, they laugh at you. This has not happened. If it happens in China, we'll say, okay, they are a communist country. They can do what they want. But it's happening, this, and not just in the poor democracies. This is happening in Canada as we speak. It's happening in the United States. I just gave you an example of that, right? So yeah, I don't, this system of democracy is, is a, a system which works for the powerful. So to be truly democratic, which is impossible to do when you're ruling a country of 1 billion people, you, it needs to be de decentralized. You need to have autonomy. And this is going to sound, again, uh, dangerous for, for people in India. Yes, you need to have internal sovereignty. You need to have communities saying, I do not want you guys coming here to dig up my land. I don't care if you think I'm a part of the country. I am not. I need this level of decentralized autonomy to be able to live the way my people want to. So why do you think all the examples I gave you from five different countries, four different continents, the same uh, uh, same inspiration, if you will, I'm going to fight till I die. What? Why, why are these people putting their lives on the line? What are they trying to protect? They're not trying to protect you know, their flats or their cars or their gold and their silver. They're trying to protect a way of life, which they know once they give permission to mine is going to go away for good. So how is it possible to design a society which allows you to keep the oil under the ground, although there is $6 billion of wealth under the ground? What does it take to keep it under the ground? That is the question. And who decides? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, two small questions, sir. Because uh, after many days, I got a man who can... A brief something about my little unethical question to you, sir. Sir, do you believe the democracy is in trouble, like this communalism? They promote the corporate agenda rather policy frames for save the planet and its ethical future in terms of uh, promoting the multinational uh, agencies and transnational networks like IMF, 
like World Bank, like WTO. Now another bank is coming that is called Infrastructural Development, Asian Infrastructure Development Bank to bridge, uh, to making bridges and roads uh, entire South Asia and East regions of Asia. What do you believe, sir? These are the uh, prom 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 promotional events for destroy our nature, destroy our culture. And, and that's what I meant, is democracy is serving whom? Who's, who's being served by democracy? It's right, it's the very much the, the market systems and the state system. I'll give you an example of how this works, yeah? So as I said, I just came back from COP26 uh, in, in Glasgow. Now, this is supposed to be, the United is this is other problem. Sometimes I think democracy is overrated. If you look at the major institutions which run our lives, right? Is the United Nations democratic? No, they're not. Is the World Bank democratic? No, they're not. Is the church democratic? No, they're not. Are universities democratic? No, they're not. So if these major institutions are not demo uh, democratic, why are we banging ahead on democracy? Especially when it comes to so whose interest is democracy being served? That's going to be the question, right? And if you look at actual decision making, how that happens, it's so undemocratic. So the example I'm going to tell you is this. I was in Durban for the 2011 COP. Uh, and in those places, because as you can imagine, security is very tight, right? You've got <coughs> heads of state, you know, like you, at that point of time, you had Obama, Angela Merkel, uh, Gordon Brown, all these, you know, Sarkozy, they were all coming there. As you can imagine how tight the security is going to be. So they have different kinds of meetings, right? There's a plenary session, which only invited people, appointees can, can come in there. And uh, I could enter as a, I was a registered delegate, but I was registered as a researcher, right, as a university, I can, I can attend those sessions, but I cannot ask any question. So I can at least say, which is fine. It was quite amazing to see world policy at work. hundred and I'm very critical of COP, but let's not forget, bringing to the 197 countries to agree on something is a major achievement, right? So I'm sitting there watching this happen. Then they have what are called closed sessions. They're called blue room sessions. Blue rooms are by inviting, invited by invite invitations only. Now there was one session I wanted to attend because at that point of time I was working on, with uh, on carbon emissions in the mining sector, and that sec that session was called carbon emissions in the mining sector. And I looked at it and said, oh my goodness, this is my research. I yeah. must attend the session. Yeah. That was a blue session. It was a closed room session. So I said, let me try. You know, I put on a jacket, tie, comb my hair, try to get in with my. You have a color coded badge. And the, I was politely turned away by the guard, saying this is a closed room session. Fine. Guess who comes in behind me and can enter that room? It's the Vice President of Shell, of BP, of Rio Tinto, of Chevron. Right? They are entering a room talking to politicians, ministers, who are going to pass laws in our countries about carbon emissions in the extractive industry. I am an independent researcher. I'm not paid by these companies. My salary comes from my taxpayers. Okay? I am not allowed in entrance into that room where a global law is being passed on emissions trading. How is that democratic? And who's passing that? It's industry and government. I can't, behind me, there was a young woman from Greenpeace. She tried to barge in and she was re refused entry as well. So you have industry and market sitting together in a room making global laws, and that's supposed to be democratic. See, see what I'm saying? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And my last question for you, sir. Sir, what is your ideas about the uh, mapping social science new theory by Vikram Jana, him, myself, sir? Uh, one pioneering young policy thinker who thinks L4 minus C4 plus MQ, GQ, the stands for social science. L4 means land, labor, leader, and liberalism. C4 means corporate, contest, community, and content. And MQ, GQ means M stands for media, monopoly, and market. G stands for, GQ stands for globalization, government, and goods. Goods means uh, quote unquote natural resources. What is your idea to mapping this social science theory today, sir, in modernization world? Well, you've identified the, the key institutions in this, but I guess for me, I look at all that and I'm asking myself, I have not read your works, so I don't know, but I'm looking at, I'm hearing you and I'm, I'm asking a simple question. Where are people in all of this? And where is the planet in all of this? 
all these uh, grand institutions, what happened to the people? They seem to have been vanished from this, right? And secondly, is what happens then to nature? So I would much, I guess, take a, you know, a much more bottom up approach. And there are many, there is not one way. People are very, very diverse. So my focus really would be on at the very, very local levels to see what kind of alternative ways of living are people developing, imagining. Right now, we don't have the vocabulary to even talk about anything else. When we talk about climate change, we immediately talk about carbon emissions and carbon trading, as opposed to why are we producing this in the first place. Yeah. So whatever model of social science you come up, come up, come through, we have to have people and planet at its center. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for very enlightening and very thought-provoking uh, deliberation. Uh, I you. hope so. People are so much engaging with your new ideas <clears throat> with this planet perspective and anthropocene, what you call it decolonization anthropocene. Thank you so much. Thank now I'd like to request uh, Professor Subham Das to go for a formal vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And first of all, I would uh, like to extend my heartfelt thanks to uh, Professor Banerjee uh, for uh, accepting our invitation and, uh, and, and uh, discussing a serious topic that needs the attention of the whole world. And also, I also extend my um, uh, gratitude to the organizing institutions, IIM Sambalpur, Koraput uh, Central University, and Aravinsa uh, University, Odisha, for organizing this event, and especially the director of CAD, um, who, who gathered all of us in this global digital platform to disseminate knowledge and interact with the new ideas and with uh, and also the necessity of the new ideas for the generation to come. And also I would like to thank all the academicians, members of this uh, civil society, media persons, and students and researchers who have present here and continued uh, this discussion. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, sir. And looking forward for future engagement also, sir. All right. And good night. Namaste, sir. Namaste. Namaste. Take care. Bye-bye.